welcome. So tonight we're going to talk about socialism, which is suddenly in mainstream public discourse, which is really surprising and fascinating to someone like me who grew up in the McCarthy and Cold War eras when the word was a taboo. And if you used it, uh, people red baited you. Now we're using it and uh, people who aren't even really socialists, I think they're old fashioned liberals, are saying they're democratic socialists. You know, Bernie Sanders being one, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who just won that surprise primary. Uh, there were 15 members of the Democratic Socialists of America who won local office from Idaho to Virginia in 2017. So I really appreciate the fact that they've put this term up for discussion. So what we want to do tonight is uh, have a discussion about what socialism means. And let's talk about it as a system. It's really a different system than capitalism. It's not what, you know, the Sanders and other people are proposing, which are really the old New Deal reforms of capitalism that tax and transfer in a progressive manner to mitigate the inequalities and other problems that are generated by the very nature of capitalism, to partially mitigate. They don't fully mitigate them. And they're politically tenuous because wealth remains concentrated in the hands of a small elite of capitalists. And that translates into political power. And when they get the opportunity, they try to roll back those programs, which is what we've been seeing for four decades here in the United States. The New Deal and Great Society programs have been blocked and rolled back to some extent. And we see it in Europe as well, even with so-called social democratic and labor parties in power, uh, they've been forced or they conceded uh, to cutting some of the programs that they had originally initiated. And that's because capital has a lot of power. It's not just campaign contributions. They can uh, go on a capital strike and bring the economy to a halt. My favorite example of that was Dennis Kucinich back in 1978 when he was the boy mayor of Cleveland. And the banks and the utilities wanted to privatize their municipally owned power company in Cleveland. And Kucinich said no. And so the bank said, okay, we're not going to roll over $13 million in credit, their line of credit, which enabled them to deal with the ups and downs of revenues coming into the city and forced the city into bankruptcy and Kucinich out of office. So they did that without campaign contributions. They did that with the concentrated power of capital. Now Kucinich was right and they weren't able to privatize because there was big inflation and it just became impossible to finance, even though the next mayor was a Republican named Voinovich, who eventually became a U.S. Senator. And then they looked back 20 years later and found out that Kucinich had saved the ratepayers of the city of Cleveland hundreds of millions of dollars. And uh, he was rehabilitated politically and served in Congress for a while. And, uh, but, you know, that shows just that these liberal programs are politically tenuous, even if we support them because they do partially improve people's lives. So socialism is really a new economic system, a democratic economic system that's democratic because it's based on social ownership of major means of production. Now, a lot of people simplistically say, well, that means state ownership versus private ownership. No, it really means democratic ownership versus dictatorial ownership, whether it's publicly owned or privately owned. A cooperative is a democratic form of ownership. Cooperatives were initiated by the socialist movement back in the 1830s and 40s. And those are enterprises where each member has an equal vote and they share equally in the proceeds of their enterprise according to their contribution, which is a socialist principle. And in the public sector, you can have a publicly owned agency like the New York Power Authority, which is anything but democratic and basically has served to uh, subsidize Municipal power uh, utilities, it's true, but also private companies uh, trying to keep industry here. But we've seen examples where there was a company out in uh, western New York that uh, built a plant with the subsidies they were getting of low power rates in Mexico. And when the NAFTA passed, they moved the plant right down there. Turned out the plant cost as much as the subsidies they received over the last decade. So we call that lemon socialism, where the government subsidizes through the public sector private enterprise. Uh, we see that in our health care system. Medicare and Medicaid are social insurance programs for the elderly and the poor 
And those people tend to be uh, poor as well as not as healthy and needing more care. So they're more expensive to insure. So the public takes the more expensive patients and then the private industry is left with the more lucrative patients who tend to be, have more money and be healthier. So that's another case of lemon socialism. So we're not talking about lemon socialism, we're talking about democratic ownership and control of major means of production. And so let's talk about a moment about socialism as a movement. Uh, it's not just something that some intellectuals hand to the people as a better idea. It's something that working people and oppressed people have to get themselves. And the socialist move the movement learned this in 1848 when the new rising business class and the working class united against the landlords. Revolutions broke out all over Europe and into Latin America. They were demanding the franchise and some economic reforms for both the businesses and the workers. And the business class got their reforms and got the vote and then they said later for the working class and ended up aligned with the landlords in the end. So what the working class drew, the lesson they drew from that is that we have to have our own independent political party. We need political class independence if we're going to have self-emancipation. And I'm afraid in this country, that's a lesson we've lost since the 1930s. And maybe if people want to talk more about it, they can ask a question about it and we can go over that history. Uh, Self-emancipation also means not just ending class exploitation, but also social oppression in different forms. I think the one that is most salient in American history is racism. And if you look at the history of progressive reform movements, it's been the failure to address racism within the movement and without compromise confront discrimination and prejudice that has ended up dividing those movements, dividing the working class and weakening in them so they could be defeated. And we see that today. I mean, that's what Donald Trump does. He's the great divider. He's using racism to do it. And he has convinced a segment of white working people and middle class people that their enemies are immigrants and people of color and foreigners and other countries, and not the small elite of capitalists that is actually running the system and creating the problems that they have grievances about. So that's one thing that the socialist movement has to put front and center. And then, of course, sexism is uh, forms of oppression that permeate everything from the workplace to our families. And it is, again, something that we've got to overcome if we're going to have a united movement. And there are other forms of oppression based on sexual orientation and disability or disability and, uh, you know, regionalism. There are all kinds of things. There are bureaucratic hierarchies where people use statuses and, you know, they sort of get the big boss complex when they're promoted to a little bit of supervision. And these are all forms of domination and uh, oppression that we have to address within the socialist movement if we're going to have a united movement of working and oppress people for liberation. I think another thing about socialism, I like uh, old Rosa Luxemburg, one of my favorite socialist phrase that there's no democracy without socialism and no socialism without democracy. You really can't have political democracy if you don't have economic democracy. And that requires social ownership of larger means of production. Otherwise you have bosses and people that take orders. And that's not democracy, that's dictatorship. And when you cross the working threshold, you lose your rights in the Constitution and you basically are told what to do by bosses. And uh, that's not democracy. So uh, you have to have socialism to have democracy. And by the same token, just because the state owns something, as I discussed before, doesn't mean it's socialism. I mean, we've had countries where the state became the capitalist and exploited people with the old wage labor system where the surplus value you create at work is taken by, in this case, the state instead of, you know, private capitalists, but it's the same to the workers. So you got to have democracy. And then I think the last thing I would uh, say to just end this opening is that we need internationalism, international solidarity of the working class and oppressed. And that's just a necessity because capitalism is a global system. And that makes the fight for freedom and equality and peace in the environment worldwide and indivisible. 
And I think one mistake we've got to avoid falling into as socialists is playing geopolitics instead of popular grassroots politics. Um, there's a tendency sometimes for even people that call themselves socialists to ally with one capitalist block of states against another. And that becomes geopolitics. They pick the lesser evil. For some, it was the Soviet bloc versus the Western bloc or the capitalist bloc. And then for others, it was the capitalist bloc versus the Stalinists. Um, we have now a case where you have this so-called axis of resistance of Shia states and movements in the Middle East with the Russians backing them, and they're seen as the lesser evil to Zionism and Western imperialism. But both are oppressive systems. That's not where socialists should be. And so our place is to be in solidarity with the socialists and the working class and the oppressed who are rising up against oppression, like the Arab Spring, and stand with them and not pick sides between states and play geopolitics. We really can't play it because we're not in power. And our power should be uh, providing support for the people in those countries that are actually fighting oppression. And as a practical matter, that means there are lots of refugees here now from these countries, and we should get to know those people and work with them and find out ways we can help them and their families and their comrades in their countries. And there are lots of ways to do that. This lesser evilism of uh, picking blocks and playing geopolitics reminds me of people who argue for lesser evilism in between the two parties in, in our country. Pick the lesser evil capitalist Democrats versus the greater evil capitalist Republicans. You're still supporting capitalism. It's not where socialists would be. And it's really a kind of self-defeating politics because we're not advancing socialism and it's demoralizing because we're not advancing what we really want. So maybe I've said enough and do we have questions? I can't see the monitor. Or it's not on. All right, we have a question from uh, Caleb who asks, uh, who, or who says, capitalists don't give up power, it's we who must take it. Social democracy can always be snatched away. True liberation, like its capitalist counterpart, also isn't given up without a fight. What, do you, what, what are your thoughts on that, Howie? Well, I think he's right when he says, and I don't know if people could hear your question, but he was asking, he's basically saying that uh, we have to uh, secure our freedom by our own actions, uh, that it won't be given to us, and that what he said called social democracy, which in the European context is very much like liberalism here, welfare state capitalism, is not secure, um, and that we have to go beyond those kind of reforms. And I agree with that. And we had a question... Uh, how does socialism fit in with modern monetary theory? Well, modern monetary theory says that you don't have to go to Wall Street to create public money to invest into the economy when you want to do public spending. You can just basically create it on computers like you could print it on a press and then put it in the budget of the government and spend that on infrastructure and social services like Social Security and it will go into the economy and create assets to back it up so it won't be inflationary. Uh, but in order to do that, we have to nationalize or socialize the Federal Reserve System, which now is a system dominated by private banks. They elect the boards of the regional Federal, uh, regional federal Reserves. And uh, although the president gets to appoint the Fed chairman, uh, the public really doesn't control it. They call it independent. Well, it's independent of the government, but not of the big banks. So to institute uh, modern monetary theory or a similar theory called, uh, well, we call it uh, green dollars in the Green Party platform nationally, um, or greening the dollar, you have to have a, um, the monetary authority within the Treasury Department as part of the government. And then they can issue uh, money like we did in the Civil War under Lincoln, greenbacks in which the populist and the labor, uh, Greenback Labor Party in the uh, 1800s and then the People's Party, that whole populist movement between the Civil War up until about 1900 was advocating. And uh, so that, yeah, I think that is part of the socialist program. And Howie, Gloria says that we need uh, democratically controlled, publicly owned, clean, renewable power. 
Uh, how is that different from some of the state-owned fossil fuel companies uh, that we see in, in companies like Nor or countries like Norway and Venezuela and other places? So I'll just repeat the question, make sure people heard it. Um, it was about having public power or energy democracy uh, and why we need it. And then uh, Michael also added, and how would what we're talking about differ from uh, undemocratic public power or uh, state power uh, energy systems? And I talked about NIPA for a minute. Uh, state oil or Stad oil in Norway, I'm not sure I pronounce it right, uh, made a lot of money for the state of Norway by investing in offshore oil in the North Sea and then even fracking here in the United States. Now, their, their purpose was to raise revenues to fund their generous uh, welfare programs. Uh, but it wasn't the fact that they were publicly owned that made them do that. It's that the mission of the state oil in uh, Norway was to maximize revenue for the state. So the mission matters. And if, you, if the public gives a mission to their public power authority, to build renewables, which, which we advocate, then they wouldn't be investing in uh, frack gas and in all its infrastructure. So why do we need this? Because the IOUs, the investor-owned utilities, like National Greed, as we call it here in Syracuse, or the Greed, when you get your bill, the Greed Cane, um, or Con Ed down in New York City, as well as Exxon, Mobil, NRG, the coal companies, the oil companies, the gas companies, have failed utterly to deal with the climate crisis, which the science says we have to uh, address, have a, a major mobilization to get to 100% clean energy and net zero carbon releases by 2030 in industrial economies like New York if we're going to avert runaway global warming and a real climate catastrophe that's going to you know, create all kinds of problems, food shortages, millions of refugees, um, besides, you know, more extreme weather. And uh, it, it, it's an Armageddon kind of situation that we've got to avoid. So what we can do with a democratic public power system is effectively plan the transition from fossils and nuclear to clean renewables, solar, wind, uh, heat pumps from air source and ground source to heat and cool our buildings, which is really a derivative of solar power heating the air in the ground. Uh, tidal, uh, hydro, these are clean sources. And to you know, make a rapid and effective transition, we've got to bring that planning. It needs to be coordinated. And the other thing is, we need to take over these fossil fuel companies because they're taking the earnings from selling fossil fuels, which we're going to use in the transition anyway. I mean, you just can't say, I'm not going to use my car and then no, not go anywhere, stop going to work and everything. We need a transition. Uh, the earnings from the sale of that oil and the sale of gas should be reinvested in renewables, not reinvested in more oil and gas extraction and fossil fuel infrastructure. And we can't rely on the Exxons of this world to do that. We've got to do it ourselves. That's why the whole energy system should be brought under public control. And this was a real discussion back in the 1970s, even when you couldn't say socialism back then. I mean, it was seen as the practical solution not just by energy activists like me. We were beginning to fight nuclear power in New Hampshire and Vermont. And then the oil crisis hit and gas prices shot up. And it looked like it wasn't because of the Arab oil embargo because we weren't importing that much oil from the Middle East. It's the oil companies took advantage of it to jack up prices. So we wanted public ownership. And it wasn't just us radicals. It, it went right to the US Senate, Henry Jackson who was a liberal on domestic policy, but very much a hawk on foreign policy, uh, was for it. The senator from Montana, Lee Metcalf, on December 18, 1974, put into the congressional record a model state energy corporation uh, legislation that was done by Lee Webb and Jeff Foe, who came out of SDS in that period in the 60s. Jeff was an economist, Lee was a uh, policy analyst. And they designed a decentralized federation of public energy districts federated at the state level. And that's what we should do, because if we're going to, have, if we're going to democratize the New York Power Authority, it should be based on local districts where the public elects the boards. 
accountable to the public, and then that, those boards elect the state board to coordinate the system statewide. We have 50 public power utilities in New York. They're mostly small villages and towns, but they provide power much cheaper than the IOUs. We have eight cooperatives, and we have NIPA. So we have the beginnings of a public power system in the state, and it's time to just pull the whole thing under one public power system. It's a natural monopoly, and it's the first uh, kind of industry you want to bring into, into social ownership. So that's a big priority for us in the Green Party because we have a big priority of getting to 100% clean energy by 2030. So we have another question. Carrie asks, can you discuss how the third party power of Huey Long and Eugene Debs positively led to Social Security insurance? Sure, uh, I think uh, the, the party of Eugene Debs gets more credit. Uh, Huey Long was an, a Democrat, not a third party candidate, but he did, uh, in kind of a demagogic way, but it was very popular, say, you know, every uh, American should, should get a share of America's wealth. And, uh, but it was Eugene Debs and the Socialist Party that said we need old age insurance. So there should be a public fund that everybody pays into as they work, and then when they retire, they have an old age pension. And that is something that uh, socialists advocated for a long time. And the role of third parties historically in this country is to put issues on the table that the two major parties won't address. And social insurance was one of those. And it goes right back to, uh, well, in this state, New York had the first workers' party in the world. It was called the Working Men's Party. And it ran candidates in uh, 1830 and elected the Carpenters president to the state assembly. And they had a program of cooperative production because farmers and artisans didn't like working in factories where they didn't get the full fruits of their labor. And they didn't uh, have control over their own work. Some boss was telling them what to do. And they were losing the skills they had brought to the uh, factory from the farm or their craft. And so they said, if we're going to have large-scale production, it's got to be democratic, and we need cooperatives. And they also stood for abolition, and not just abolition, but reparations. The uh, freedmen should uh, be compensated for their unpaid labor with land and tools. They were for women's suffrage. They even wanted the Indian nations incorporated into the United States as part of our federal system. Uh, they were quite advanced. And out of that came, you know, the Liberty Party for abolition, the Free Soil Party, which was land reform and abolition, uh, the, labor, the Greenback Labor Parties and the People's Parties of the Populist Era, and then the Socialist Party of the Socialist Era up to, up to the 1930s when uh, the Roosevelt administration adopted something the Socialists had been talking about for a long time. And Huey Long uh, helped because at that point he started talking about the same stuff there in the early 1930s. So Sandy says, the New York Health Act, something, I can't, the uh, keyboard is in the way, and is a socialist health care system. Yes, as I mentioned earlier, we have lemon socialism now. We have Medicare and Medicaid, which uh, has the public provide health care for people the private insurance companies can't make much money off of because they're poor and they're generally sicker because they're older or they're, they're poor. And uh, so they cherry pick the uh, healthier and wealthier. Um, so the New York Health Act would, would set up a social insurance program for health care for everybody. Everybody would be in the plan and the wealthier, healthier people would cross subsidize the, uh, the poor and less wealthy. Um, but it would be funded by progressive taxation. In fact, under the analysis that was done of the act by Gerald Friedman uh, in an economic analysis, 98% of us would pay less in these progressive taxes than we do now in the taxes we pay for Medicare and Medicaid and some other public programs, our premiums, our deductibles, our co-pays, and then those things that aren't covered or the insurance companies refuse to cover that end up coming out of pocket. So the New York Health Act is definitely part of the Green Party program. It is a socialist kind of program. The only qualification I would say is that um, we had a big debate back in the 70s. Um, the Kennedy bill, the Nixon bill, and the Dellums bill. 
The Nixon bill was like uh, Obamacare or Romney care. It was uh, state support for private health insurance. And there were some mandates that you had to get health insurance. And then the Kennedy bill was what was called national health insurance. And that goes back to the New Deal, something the Democrats had on their platform from the 1940s to uh, Clinton took it off the program in 1992. And that was a single payer system, Medicare for all. But there was a more left-wing proposal for a national health service that was developed by the Medical Committee for Human Rights, which was the civil rights uh, doctors and uh, medics who treated people that were getting their heads beat in during civil rights demonstrations and then anti-war demonstrations. And they wanted a service where the providers were nonprofit or public and were on salary, not in profit-maximizing institutions. And there was a great article written by uh, Oliver Fine and John Ehrenreich called The Great Leap Sideways. And they feared that the uh, socialized insurance system would be uh, basically a feeding trough for the drug companies and the hospitals and so forth because they would just submit their payments and the public would have to, there wouldn't be good cost control. So a, so a full system of socialized medicine would be a step further. In the UK and Britain, they first had insurance, uh, so health insurance for workers from 1911 and found problems with it. And in 1946, they adopted a health service where the whole system is publicly owned. The hospitals and clinics, the doctors and the nurses and the health providers are on salary. And uh, they get good salaries. They're you know, well compensated and everybody's covered. So I think we need to pass the New York Health Act now. That's where the movement's at. That's what the people want. It's very popular. And then see how it goes. And uh, if we need to, maybe the next step is a health service. So is there supposed to be a question there? Because I don't see it. All right. So uh, Steve says his impression is that the green politics movement arose during the 1970s as people started to acknowledge that the socialist movement had failed to achieve its aspirations. Um, and so, yes, the capitalist system surely needs to be replaced. Uh, the Green Party's key value of community-based economics can and should be informed with a post-capitalist ethos. Uh, what is your, uh, what's your reaction to that? Well, yeah, the Greens are really the one party that came out of the new left, which rejected both Stalinism and Western European social democracy which no longer was really anti-capitalist. It was uh, for welfare state programs, New Deal type liberal reforms um, that left capitalism in place. And also the uh, Greens coming out of the new left were critical of both the Soviet bloc and the Western bloc uh, for their nuclear arms race and their uh, proxy wars around the world and they didn't want to stand with either bloc. They wanted to be a third camp. So they had criticism of uh, what socialism had become in both its Stalinist form and its Western European social democratic form. Uh, so what was it going to be replaced with? And that was a big debate. I mean, there were, you know, Greens who said uh, it's neither capitalism nor socialism, but we need a new system. Uh, others who tended to be on the left of the Greens said we know, need to go back to the original socialist ideals of economic democracy. Uh, there were debates that were go back in the socialist movement between more the Marxian socialism, which foresaw state planning and centralization in the anarchist tradition, which saw more a federal model from the bottom up. And uh, all those kind of debates were going on in the Green movement and still are to this day. Um, and I'm trying, your question appeared for a minute and disappeared. Um, so community-based economics, uh, look, I, I will make this argument that the best thing that could happen to uh, people with the entrepreneurial spirit, whether they want a small business, we'd prefer cooperatives, but small and medium-sized businesses, they're getting killed by the overhead costs of credit from Wall Street. They can't get it. Wall Street isn't interested in them. They're more interested in extracting rent and interest in real estate or, uh, you know, with the extra wealth that the rich are getting with like these Trump tax cuts there, they're doing stock buybacks. They're manipulating financial assets that prey and, and are like parasites on the real economy of producing goods and services. So we got to reduce the overhead. 
Single payer health care, the New York Health Act, will reduce the cost of health care for businesses. Public power, uh, public power nationally provides uh, power at 13% less than IOUs, investor-owned utilities. Um, I didn't talk about public broadband. I mean, broadband rates are inflating as fast as health care, way beyond the general rate of inflation. The customer service is abysmal. Uh, they haven't built out to the inner cities and the rural areas. Um, you know, so we need public broadband network also to secure net, net neutrality and privacy protections, which the Trump administration has removed from the Internet. Um, we need a social wealth fund so that uh, what remains the capitalist sector, corporate sector, uh, we have a fund of the state that buys the shares of these companies and gradually makes that public property. And then it's redistributed to the citizens and citizens dividends kind of like the Alaska Permanent Fund Corporation, which takes the oil revenues and distributes the citizens' dividend to their people. Or the Norway has a sovereign wealth fund and they take their earnings from their investments, it's the largest in the world, and it's a big help to funding their social programs. Um, these are things we can do right now, but that doesn't mean we're gonna take over every last business. And if we lower the costs of doing business by lowering, lowering these overhead costs, it's gonna create a better business climate. And uh, that should enable small and medium businesses and cooperatives that we would like to create uh, flourish. And when you say community-based businesses, I think a lot of us would like to see more local business owners who live in our communities, like providing coffee shops, restaurants, hardware stores, the things that used to be in the neighborhood business strip and downtown, better than these chain stores. Uh, which basically suck money out of the community. They don't, the only wages that are left behind are the minimum wages they pay to the local people that work there. Otherwise, they buy from outside the community. So local ownership, even capitalist or private ownership, uh, has better benefits than these chains that suck money out of our, out of our community. So you know, I think within the Green Party, the term community-based economics means a mix of a large sector of socially owned, particularly public utilities, and I would consider banking a public utility, but they would be in partnership with credit unions and community banks, not these big Wall Street banks. Um, so you have a big sector there, a big sector of cooperatives, and a, another sector of uh, small privately owned businesses and partnerships, where workers are really worker owners and uh, earning their keep, unlike the uh, elite 1%. So Ron says, no. Howie Hawkins should be the next president of the United States. Let's, let's get governor first. And uh, with six candidates and the vote spread, I'm thinking more and more we got a real shot. What would a socialist approach to affordable housing uh, look like? And we have had, since the 1970s, the federal government backed away from federal housing. They give out vouchers with subsidized landlords, and then they provide uh, subsidies to private developers to build some affordable housing. And the subsidies were time limited and then the developments uh, lose regulation and uh, they become either uh, disregarded by their investors and become real slums. And then the state has to take them over. We had a case here in New York, uh, in Syracuse called Kennedy Square. And eventually it was torn down and uh, handed over to core development. These people that were just convicted of bid rigging on the Buffalo Billion, they got that property for uh, no bid, no money down. And just as an aside, we need to reopen that Moreland Commission on Public Corruption, look into that and a whole lot of other stuff that's been going on. Cuomo never should have shut that down. But uh, back to where I was talking about was, what was the question? I got off on that tangent. It was on uh, affordable housing. Affordable housing. So it's much cheaper to directly build affordable housing because um, you're operating at cost for public benefit, not for private profit. <clears throat> and we can build much more self-reliant economically public housing by making it mixed income, like they do in Europe. Middle class people, even upper middle class professionals, live right there with poor people. They're mixed up. We have the most segregated housing in the country in New York. We could begin to desegregate our housing with these new public housing units. Uh, they should be high quality. They should be human scale and scatter site to help with desegregation, not like the old projects that were you know, bigger than human scale and concentrated poor and minority people, segregated them, isolated them from job opportunities and services and just created ghettos. So 
That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a new kind of public housing that is quality. And it, it, it should also be powered by clean energy. Uh, solar and wind for electricity and heat pumps instead of gas for heating and cooling. So this would be not just a program for affordable housing. It would be a jobs program. It would be a desegregation program. And it would be a clean energy program. So that's a socialist approach to uh, the housing crisis that we have. Uh, I would just add that we need uh, to extend rent control authority across the state. Uh, that's a short-term solution. If we just do rent control without building more affordable units, it's just going to jack the rents up that aren't controlled and drive people into homelessness, or at least out of their communities. So, um, so it's time to wrap up, I guess. Talk about our plans. Uh, coming up. Okay. Well, uh, I think we've just scratched the surface and I think there were more questions. So maybe we'll have to do this again. And, uh, but we're going to talk about it again tomorrow in Albany. I'm going to do a news conference in the legislative, uh, chambers, uh, press room to call it the LCA press room in the Capitol building, uh, about social solutions to pressing problems New York state faces. And uh, Mark, our comptroller candidate, and I will be talking about uh, why socialism is a new economic system, not just some liberal programs that try to ameliorate the problems that capitalism creates. We're going to talk about public banking, public energy, public housing, public broadband, the social wealth fund, and uh, I think something else. There's, there's a whole list. And I'm sure the reporters will have questions that will get us on to other uh, issues. Um, and then we're going Saturday uh, down to the picket line uh, protesting the Competitive Power Ventures frack gas plant in Orange County, which is a devastating project that adds 10% to the state's carbon footprint if it goes forward. It was greased through the regulatory process by bribes from uh, Peter Galbraith Kelly Jr. of Competitive Power Ventures to Joe Prococo, the brother from another mother, as Andrew Cuomo called him, who was one of Cuomo's top aides. This thing was uh, started with corruption and it should be shut down for that reason as well as its devastating environmental impact. And we're calling on Governor Cuomo to re uh, re rescind those permits and dismantle this monstrosity and return that farm land to what it was, farmland. Uh, so that's on Saturday. And uh, I need my calendar to see what I'm doing Sunday. But every day, we're doing more and more. And uh, we're just a couple hours from uh, reaching our fundraising goal. Uh, at midnight tonight uh, will be the close of this uh, financial reporting period that goes to the State Board of Election. And of course, the media wants to know how much money we've raised. And we won't raise as much as the other candidates. We already know that. But we had a goal of uh, reaching 25000 so far for the campaign. And it's within reach. Uh, last time I looked, we were 2000 short, but there have been some more donations come through. So um, if you can reach into your pocket and go to the website, HowieHawkins.org, go online, make a donation before midnight, uh, maybe we'll get to that 25000 mark. The media will be looking. And uh, they'll use that as a gauge of whether we're serious or not. For us, we're very serious with $25,000 because we, our money goes a lot further than the other parties. We don't hire high-paid consultants to waste our money. Uh, we have a few people helping to organize the grassroots to get out there, talk to the voters, identify the supporters, spread the message, and uh, basically do this with small donations and people power at the grassroots. But we do need some money because I can't do that as well as you know, do news conferences, write press releases, you know, run here, there, and everywhere. I need some people that, who also have to pay rent and put food on the table uh, to be working on this at least part-time, if not full-time. So please see if you can make a little donation or a big donation uh, before midnight tonight. Thank you.